Hello everybody, this is Graham Anderson, and today I'm going to be looking at The Hunger. Now when I first saw this game box, there are a number of things that caught my eye. First, the designer, Richard Garfield. He has designed some truly great games, from Magic the Gathering to The King of Tokyo. Then I actually just looked at this entire cover, and you know what? I really like the art and the look of this game. And finally, when I read the back of the box, it's based on the deck building mechanism. So that's just another plus for me. In this game, you're going to be playing a vampire, leaving your castle and trying to hunt the villagers around your castle, essentially for points. But, of course, you have to be back before sunrise, or you can be burnt to an ash and cannot win the game. The basic mechanisms of this game are deck building, where you're going to be playing all the cards in your hand, activating any abilities that those cards give you, then using the speed from your cards to move along the path away from your castle, and any leftover speed you can use to hunt cards and add them to your deck. So, will this game be like a vampire and be kept inside all safe and warm and out from the sunlight, or should it be left in the sun and just burnt to ash? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played, then we'll come back with my final thoughts on The Hunger. So here's The Hunger setup for three players. I'm going to be showing you the Elder game, which is this side of the board, and the other side of the board is the Rookie board. I'll explain the differences later on when I do my final thoughts. Place the hunt track to one side with the number of rows equal to the number of players plus one. Each player picks a vampire sheet, takes their cards, the score tracker, which goes on zero, and their player piece, which goes on the castle. Take the hunt deck and remove the three roses cards and place them in the labyrinth spot on the board. The rest of the hunt deck are shuffled together and placed near the hunt track. Take three of the cards and place them on the tavern face down. Bonus tokens are shuffled and placed on all the chests on the board, and any one that is placed on an open chest, you're going to reveal it. Place the turn tracker on the first knight and place the number of castle tokens for the number of players. The mission cards are shuffled for the number of players, Two beige background ones are revealed for the public missions, and randomly give each player two missions and they'll keep one and return the other. Then, place six random missions in the mountain missions area, five in the plans mission area, and four in the forest mission areas. Each player draws three cards, and the player with the lowest speed will go first. Then draw one card for each row in the hunt track. Now since this game was all about the cards, let's take a closer look at the different types of cards. The starting cards will show its owner, a name, the speed the card gives you, and an effect. For hunt cards, they are grouped into four different types. Humans, which are the main way to get points. Familiars, which when obtained will stay by your side and give you a benefit each turn. Power cards. And finally roses, which can only be obtained by going to the end of the track. All these hunt cards have the same layout. The speed they will give you when played, the number of victory points you'll get when you hunt the card, an effect, and a type of card. And there are four different types of humans, then power cards, familiars, and items. So on to the gameplay. For the start of the game, the vampire with the lowest speed goes first. In subsequent rounds, it's going to be the person that is furthest from the castle will go first, and there's a whole list of tiebreakers if a tie occurs. On your turn, you will do three steps. Activate any discarded draw abilities, calculate your speed and use it to move and or hunt, then clean up, then it's the next player's turn. So on your turn, lay out all the cards from your hand into your play area. Any cards that have a discarded draw effects can be used now. If you ever need to draw a card and you draw a pile is empty, shuffle your discards and create a new deck. Next, calculate your speed. Add up all the speed numbers from all the cards in your play area. You can use this to first move your vampire. Now, of course, you do not have to move or move the full amount, because any amount of speed you have left over after movement will be used for a single hunt. When you move, you can only move in one direction. And if you land on the same space as another vampire, you can push that vampire to an adjacent space. If you move, then you will trigger the effect of the space that you end your movement on. If you don't move, you cannot re-trigger the same space that you started on. The spaces on the board are the cemetery, and you cannot hunt here, and you cannot be pushed. If you land on a chest, take the bonus and immediately receive two victory points. You can use the special ability the bonus gives you once per game, and they're all outlined in the rulebook. If you land on a crypt, take the pile of missions and replace all but one. This allows you to trade in a previously held mission as long as you end up with one more mission in your hand than before you landed on the space. The labyrinth allows you to hunt one rose at no cost. There are four digestion buildings, the market, the church, the mansion, and the barracks. Each one is color-coded to match a human type. When you land on one of these spaces, you can digest one matching human from your play area or your discard pile. That means you're going to place them below your player board and is out of your deck. You will still score it, if applicable at the end of the game, 
but will not be shuffled back into your deck. The ship spaces means you cannot hunt. The tavern space allows you to hunt the entire pile at the tavern for two speed, but you have to take the entire stack without looking through it. And finally, the wells. You receive an extra hunt, but it can only be used on the one column of the hunt board. And when you come back to the castle at the end of the game, you're going to be taking the highest point value token available, then your game is over. Once you have moved and activated the space, if applicable, then you can hunt with however much speed you have left over. You'll pick one group of cards and pay the speed to take the entire pile. So if I wanted this card, I'd have to pay three speed. And if there's a card here, I'd only have to pay one speed. Any unspent speed is lost, and when you hunt, you immediately score the points listed on the card. You'll also score any bonus points depending on where you hunted it. For each human hunted in the plains, you're going to score an additional point, and two additional points for hunting in the forest. All hunted cards go directly into your discard pile. Once you've hunted, end your turn. Flip your vampire over, discard all played cards other than the permanent cards you've just played, then activate any end of turn abilities. Finally, you're going to draw three cards. Once all players have gone, prepare for the next round. Move the moon token, flip all the vampire tokens to their active side, move all remaining hunt cards one space to the right. Now the one space can hold an unlimited number of cards, so no cards are ever going to be discarded from the hunt track. Then you're going to draw hunt cards to fill up the column 3, and finally add one card to the tavern pile, of course face down. The game ends after 15 rounds. Any vampires outside of the castle and the cemetery will lose 5 points. Any vampires outside the cemetery will be burnt to ash and are out of the game. For all players left in the game, so those in the castles or in the cemetery, are going to be adding victory points from your cards that have an end of game scoring, then score the public missions, and finally your private missions. Then the player with the most victory points is the winner. Now let's get back to see what I thought about the hunger. So on to theme and components. The theme in this one is definitely on the light side, and by that I mean it's a little more comical than a dark or scary game. That being said, the theme is just a very thin veneer in this game. Nothing you're doing mechanism-wise feels very thematic. You're going out hunting, sure, but you're not digesting or eating what you capture unless you specifically do that action on only certain spaces. So I guess you're just kind of getting them on your side, but then why do some of them have negative effects for you? So you know what, the theme doesn't make much sense, but it's fun nonetheless. On to the components. There, I thought they really did a good job on the components. I really like the art. Now, not everybody I played with liked it, but the art definitely worked for me. The cards are good quality, and there's a fair number of cards too, 122 in total. The cardboard components were okay if a bit on the small side, and I did like that the board was double-sided for the Rookie and the Elder mode. So for the components, I liked them and thought they worked well in the game. I do wish though that there was a better outline or description of the differences between the cemetery, plains, and forest areas on the board, especially when you're first learning the game, as it's not overly obvious. So on to the gameplay. Now before I start, I just wanted to quickly mention the differences between the Rookie and the Elder mode. And the Elder mode is the one I showed through the walkthrough. So in the Rookie mode, there are going to be more spaces you can be safe at the end of the game. So not just the cemetery, which is the, the first three spots in, outside the castle, but actually anywhere in the mountains will be safe. Albeit with an increasing point loss the further you are away from the castle. Also in Rookie mode, you actually stack the hunt deck to make it easier to start. And you also get a smaller set of public missions to choose from, or to be randomized, at the beginning of the game. The rest of the game stays exactly the same, so there's not a huge difference. The gameplay itself is fine. You're playing your cards, activating the abilities, then moving and hunting. And that works okay, but I did have some issues with the game. First is actually the lack of abilities. Most of the time you're going to be playing your three cards and getting speed to move and hunt. No special abilities, no big combos you can pull up. Yes, there are some cards that say you know, you have one speed, unless you have a human in your play area, then it's a three. Or if you have a human, draw an extra card. Nothing overly exciting. Even the cards you hunt aren't any more exciting than that. I was never planning on combos, like, oh, if I draw this card and this card together, I can pull off this great turn. Each turn felt pretty much like the last. I was never thinking, oh, if I can hunt that card and that card, I can have this really great combo in my deck. It just didn't work like that. Combined with the fact that generally you only had one hunt per turn, it just didn't make the, feel, make the game feel overly dynamic. Now another issue I had with the game is actually the balance of some cards. Some cards are clearly better than others. Why would I hunt a one value card over a five value card if it's in the same column? They cost the same. I only get one hunt and there's no difference in the abilities because neither one of these probably have an ability. 
Now, it might be because of my mission, or if I happen to hunt a human that grants me bonus points for having a lot of the same, you know, same type of military guys. But in 15 rounds, you're not going to be able to make up the difference, I don't think, anyway. I would love to have the low value humans have a better ability, so I had more choice. As it stands, most of the time, I'm going to strictly going to be hunting based on the number of points that they give me. Now, I did like that the one space on the hunt track could be potentially filled up with multiple cards, and in most games, it happened in which one or two of those spaces filled right up with three or more cards, which made it very tempting. Because the downside of getting too many cards, or humans especially, is that they generally don't have any movement, which means you can have turns where you're going to be nothing, as it's kind of difficult to thin your deck out. It does mean that you, ha you have to strategically hunt, or, you know what, just not go very far, and just to hunt a lot of humans because you don't have to worry about them moving as much. Now, I really did like their familiars and the power cards. They were usually beneficial, and were something different than the humans. Those Rhodes cards are fun, but I really kind of never found worth the effort to go and get. And that's another issue I had with the game. Everywhere is basically the same. The deck is not stacked in any way. The missions aren't stacked in any way. It doesn't matter how far you go out, you're not getting any better stuff. Now, there are more treasure chests the further you go away from the castle. And you do score extra points for hunting in the plains and the forest. But you only get one hunt. Now, I've played games where people purposely said, I'm going to go to the end of the track to get a rose. I'm going to buy cards that help me with that strategy so I can get there and back within the 15 rounds. Because it's not easy to do. And at the end of the game, they scored around the same points as the person who just stayed in the planes. In the planes, you still have access to the same cards and the same missions. They're just all randomized. You may not get the extra bonus points, but you know what? You're probably going to be able to hunt more humans. So it all seemed to even out no matter which strategy you took. So in multiple games, we had people going for those roses, and it really made no difference, and that was kind of frustrating. And one last minor annoyance was the little bits of the game we kept forgetting. You know, don't forget your extra points when you're hunting in the plains or in the forest. Oh, and don't forget to move the round marker, and don't forget to add a little, an extra card to the tavern each round. Like I said, this is nothing major. Just little annoyances that I think every game I played, we forgot one of those things in more than one round, and I played this game more than five times. So would I recommend this game? I think unfortunately not. Don't get me wrong, I thought the game was okay. Not bad, but just not something I'm dying to get back to the table. I like the art and the components. The gameplay is quick and easy to learn. There are some late decisions to be made based on the strategy you're going for. And I really like the tavern spot where you can get a lot of cards, but it could also be risky to bloat your deck too much. On the negative side though, I kind of really missed the lack of card abilities. There were some, but I never felt I could pull off a great combo or a great turn. I also wish that there was more advantage for going further out into the forest. Yes, there are more treasure chests. Yes, there are two spots you can digest humans to thin out your deck. Yes, you get your points for hunting. And you get to hunt first. But it really didn't seem to be worth the effort at the end of the game. And this ended up being my biggest negative. I felt all the players could just happily live at the edge of the plains and just do as well as the person who risked a fair bit to run out of the forest or even get it all the way to the labyrinth. So why bother? Just stay where it's safe, concentrate on your missions and hunt valuable humans. You only have 15 turns, so there's, a lot, there's not a lot else you could be doing. So overall, I'm going to give this game a 6.5 out of 10. I thought the game was okay, and maybe it's because I wanted something more from the game. I wanted the feeling of being able to pull off a great turn or get something special for being so far away from the safety of the castle and pressing my luck. But I never felt that. And the game just left me wanting more from it. And honestly, when I leave a game wanting more, I'll go play another game that gives me those feelings. And this one for me will unfortunately be forgotten. And that's it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching.